My name is Wilson Aronial Jr. Well, he claims himself to be the White Stallion. Yeah, we say, what in the world did you get your name? You have a real weird name. So one day in my young life, I thought, what, that, what do they mean? And I look at, into the dictionary, look up the word weird, and we come to the conclusion that it means something not too good. So I, I guess through a good curiosity, I researched my name. I've come to find out my name Wilson came from England, English people who were farmers. Wilson means a well-to-be person. And then through my father, I found out my last name was eventually pronounced as Ayania. In our language, Ayane means buffalo. But then my, my, my dad changed the spelling of our last name. Now, today, it's called Aronioth. That name came from Asia, Mongolian people. What Aronioth means is white stallion, a horse. And then Junior eventually just means my, um, I have my dad's name. So that's how I come to realize that my name's all right. So I thought I better keep my name clean. I don't want to have my name written anywhere in a negative side of, of life. I was always been disciplined and instructed by my grandmother. Her name was um, Glindy Ba Hunt. She's the one that raised me, always stressed and told me, Navajo Dene South Clan introduction is one of the most highest and important value and belief in Navajo way of life. My first clan, they call it Nazi Litanekitichitni. That's like the rainbow clan of the Red House people, Red House clan. My mother told me I was born for Nanishtetichitni. Literally, I'm born for Zuni Red Street running into the water clan. Then I have a my che. She che e tratne sani tohan denne. That's my maternal grandfather, which is near the water clan. And then my paternal grandfather, the Shinadi e betahni denne, which are they call it today under the sleeve clan, but it, it reflects the big water clan too. So that's my identification. 1933, November 20th, it was snowing. I guess my mom couldn't have me at the whole gun. she was scared. So there was only one man that had a Model T truck. And they asked, my grandpa wanted to ask him, so this eventually was supposed to rest us to ship wrong. But on the way, but 800 yards from my grandma's kokum, I was born right there in the back of that cold dump truck. <laughs> Model T. My grandma used to tease me about my birthplace. And my birth certificate is a mystery because I was born on reservation. They make it sound like I don't exist. I didn't meet my mother and father until I was 15 years old. The story says when I was about Five days old, I was given to my grandmother. She taught me about the role of a young man, how to live and understand myself, take care of myself, how to be honest with myself, how to be obedient. What I learned growing up, when my voice changed as a young man, they had to build a sweat ceremony to acknowledge my poverty. The first thing I learned about sex, so Koto, my grandpa says, there's going to be a feeling in your life where you're feeling you need a female. So that feeling is something you cannot just abuse. And so that feeling of wanting and the absence of sex, it's a natural, sacred feeling. And I guess that's where you understand that's where unconditional love comes in. If you're not taught as a man, then you'll just go and abuse it, go from woman to woman to woman. You'll never get enough. Our wedding was planned out traditionally. Marie Aronil is her name. Her maiden name is 
Marie Foster Soul. Her mother was from New Mexico. Her dad was from here. Her mother was from a place called White Rock. There is time you argue, disagree on things, but you end up coming back and compromise and talk about it. But I always kind of feel that if you were to evaluate my marriage, from my perspective, about 98% of my married life was enjoyable and good. We practically raised one another because we got married at a young age. I was 22 years old, she was only about 18. And so our lifestyle was different. We had no vehicle, nothing. In, in our marriage, we had to walk, ride horses, and drive a wagon. I always say, I will never ever trade her with another woman. And that's the woman I dedicated my life to. And so that was the only woman that wanted me and put up with me all these many years. I went to a five-year special program. One day, for some reason, something told me, maybe you need to check into So I checked into school. I took my GED test and made it up to 11th grade level and pursued on, got my GED. And then I went to night school at Los Angeles College and took up some courses. That's how I developed. When I came to work, I went to Fort Lewis and I kind of got my AA here. Then I went and got my other uh, certification to teach novel values and culture history and arts and craft from different college universities. But one day I ended up challenging PhD degree. And part of it is honorary degree because one day I went to work for Navajo Community College, which is now college today. I started working for this institution in 1969. And it was Nad Hatasi that offered me a contract to teach Navajo culture. And I told him, I don't know anything about teaching as far as classroom involvement. But he says, no, I'm not asking if you went to school to be an educator. I think you are an educator in your own way. So teach Navajo culture, knowledge, and history the way you were taught. And so the very first day I ever entered a classroom was the later part of 1969, 1970. When I walked into that classroom, there was no type of material or method or curriculum, no course syllabus or course content. And I started off from the scratch and developed my own course syllabus and course content and a lot of these stories. And that's how I kind of wrote eventually six books. This is the first one, Foundation Novel Culture, then Novel Philosophy, Novel Oral History, and then Novel Introduction, Novel Holistic Healing. And then Foundation Navajo Behavior, which is a psychologist, and then Navajo Silversmithing. My grandmother, Glendy Ba Hunt, was my educator, my philosopher, my psychologist, my culture teacher, my arts and craft teacher, and everything. That's where I got the information. And she said it came from divine nature, the holy people. They gave it to her people to understand what life is all about. So my resource and reference is my grandmother and the holy people. That's where it came from. And I didn't go to any school or college or university or library to do research and it was what was instilled to me where I learned it by listening, and sitting in the whole gone like this, all hours, the night or day, you know. And I guess grandma didn't really have anyone there, so she shared a lot of knowledge with me. When I was hurting she with her, I was right there beside her. And I don't know how, just a little portion of it that I comprehend was instilled into my mind. That's what it is. So I always tell my younger people, my knowledge is smaller than the mustard seed. I don't know everything. My grandma says, one day when you tell your stories, somebody's going to always eventually going to disagree with you. But don't say nothing. Just tell the story the way you were told. Don't delete or add or exaggerate. Just tell it the way you were told. And so mine was simple. So that's what I always tell them. The way you were told, I respect you for that. So the way I was told, this is how my grandma, it came from Red House Clan. That's the story where it come from. And so sometimes people challenge me. 
But some of those individuals that criticized me, their sons and daughters, grandchildren came and took my class. They came back. But some of them came back and kind of apologized. I said, I'm sorry. I said, my daughter and one of my grandsons took your sponsors and other culture class and philosophy class. They came back a different person. I'm happy about that. But I got involved in writing books to help my younger generation to understand at least when I leave this world, there'll be something that I'll leave here they might benefit by and read it and maybe enjoy it, I don't know. I guess mainly it's my commitment to say, hey, look, there's novel knowledge. There's these beautiful understanding that you can learn. Maybe you don't have to believe it, but at least read it and respect our people. I think today, Western education is important, and our novel education is important. If you put two and two together, you can be someone today to understand all cultural values. Chief Malito said, my people, my relatives, we have no alternative to, but to accept the philosophy of Western education. We don't know if this education has a heart, a mind, a soul, a spirit, whether it has prayer song, or whether it's a living education, but it's foreign to us, but we have no alternative but to accept it. But this is what I want you to rem remember. Never ever underestimate, deny, or contradict, or confuse yourself and forget your language. Your language is important. The color of your skin doesn't make you unique. Your language makes you unique. Your prayers, your song, your spiritual holistic belief makes you unique. Your language is the key to challenge this education and learn it as far as you can because it's offered to us. We didn't ask for it. They want us to be educated. Whatever way that our education, this education, Western education system takes us. Let's never deny and forget our vision, mission, and goal of where we came from, why we're here, the direction we're going. Maybe if we make some connection, it'll help us to re-improve, to redevelop and regrow ourselves as we go. That was the expression that was made. 1950 is when we got involved in bilingual by culture education. But it took from 1950 to about 1964 when Raymond Alke became child parents. Let's not talk about it, let's go for it. And so I thought I need to help somehow. So some of these elders says, they, they'll say it like this in Navajo language. Oh, ah, nothing at the tea. Bendy, ah, big a ho chicken, big a ho tata. Need to take a kin hutchin, benum tin don't let. A cut up a hot at all. That whole expression, my translation was we need foundation of novel culture knowledge to be reinstilled into a generation. That's how it brought me to writing this. I think education gives you stability and foundation if you, you know, if the goal is set right. I learned a tremendous amount of information from him about my culture, about our practices, and what I also learned in his class was how to properly introduce myself in Navajo with my clans. Everyone who takes a class from Dr. Wilson and Ramoth learns how to properly introduce themselves in Navajo. I call Dr. Wilson Roth Shiche, my maternal grandfather. Uh, my uh, Che's are Kintla Chitney, and Dr. Wilson Ronald is Kintla Chitney. So by clan, he's Shiche, and he addresses me as my granddaughter, Shitsu. In Navajo, clanship is important, as is the concept of Ke, establishing relationships with all in the universe, and um, clanship is an important part of that. And um, I just address him with great respect, as I would my grandfather. He's been here at Diné College for a long time, and one of our faculty that we value 
here and he works in the Center for Diné Studies Department. It's quite common to have uh, many of his courses filled to capacity, at least 25 per section, and he could be responsible for teaching 15 hours a semester. I don't know where he gets his wealth of energy. He's so much energy. I mean, from every day and he teaches and then on weekends he does prayers, conducts prayer services and presents cultural stories, knowledge. So he's, God, you know, he's endless energy. And his relationship with students, I think students really enjoy him being a teacher. You know, he's just become a symbol, one of the uh, figureheads of Diné College. I really, really wholeheartedly, tremendously support my younger generation. I always say this, okay, my younger generation, even if you were my son, daughter, grandson, whoever you might be, by clan relatives, it doesn't make any difference who you are. You're all intelligent, beautiful. You got the mind, you got the expertise, the skill, ability, and potential to do something good. That, that's my feeling to all of you. That was my commitment. I guess basically, I am retired, but I always think whatever way my prayers, my song, my belief, my creator, what I believe in takes me, if I'm needed, I'll go until time will tell when I'll leave, you know, educational system. And I believe there's no such thing as retired. You retire until you grow old and go back to this old place, uh, or old age place, they say. He was always there as a good father. He always told us right from wrong. And he told us, regardless of who was wrong, you know, show respect to whoever you run into. If you show them respect, they'll show you respect. All these things that he tries to teach people, he's doing it out of love and respect for his grandfathers and grandmothers. He's not trying to become famous or anything like that. He's just trying to get the word out. He's 100% loyal to what he knows, what he's been taught. He ain't going to change it. I tell students, this is the time to come to the next college. These elder folks are not going to be here for very long. I am privileged to be here and working with him as an influence, as a contributor to a lot of individuals' personal health and well-being, academically and also spiritually and culturally. And he deserves that, that recognition and acknowledgement of making a contribution to a lot of people's lives. Well, I would say he's the real McCoy. He's the, the genuine, what you might say, Itana and Navajo. And uh, I would say that uh, he came long ways with his wife and children and grandchildren up to the point today where you can say that he's a man, he's a warrior.